Good evening. Great to see you back here this evening. 87, page number 87, your red hymnal. <laughs> it's church time, guys. Let's go. Page number 87. Let's stand together and sing more about Jesus would I know. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. Who died? Page 87 on the second. More about Jesus, let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be. Showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. tonight. All right, you still saved? So far, so good. All right, amen. Deb Porter walked in here just now. I just mentioned David this morning. We had a young couple visiting from Nunica, and I said, hey, I got a friend of mine. He's preaching at the Bible church up in Nunica, and they mentioned Dave, and then here you come walking in this evening. Those of you who don't know Debbie, and uh, her and she and her late husband, and uh, one of the greatest Christians I've ever known. David Porter, and they were out of our church for about 10 years, evangelism, and uh, she lives over in Ada, no, Alto, I always get those A's mixed up, Alto, and they drove, man, that's like, that's like the pits driving all this way for church, and uh, they drive all that way, every service here for soul winning on Saturdays, everything, and uh, they're just such a blessing to our heart, and she plays something that Dovey doesn't even know how to play. She plays the cowbells, and uh, yeah, I had the cowbells. I always enjoyed that, and, uh, such a blessing. Did you turn your phone off, Josh? Dude, man, watching football in church, what in the world is it coming to, man? Yeah, he turned it off when church started. It's just football. It's a bunch of anarchist, overpaid, spoiled brats, and you know, yeah, a bunch of communist, un-American yeah, well, glory to God, I am just getting wound up, man. You ain't even seen what the rest of the message is tonight, man. Yeah, remember this morning, they'll corrupt your message, pervert message, and then they'll silence you. And tonight we're going to learn out how to respond to that appropriately. and uh, Appropriately. Now we're going to learn how to respond to it in a fun way, and then we're going to have to do it the right way. So uh, we got to do those. And, uh, so, <laughs> I know, I know, Ron. I know, brother. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the two parts, you know. Yeah, first we'll do the fun way, then we'll do it the right way. Yeah, 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 second one's not quite as much fun. But, uh. All right, so you starting on your house again tomorrow? Yeah, what are they doing tomorrow? <coughs> Electrical, siding, and windows then coming up. They put an addition onto their house, as you know. They host, oh, it's like every Friday, they got kind of an open mic night or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they took their deck and they just tore it off and used that as a foundation for their addition to their house because they got so many people coming over to fellowship all the time they needed more room and uh, I can appreciate that but uh, 
I just stuff them all in our house. What we have there today? 36, I think, today in our house. 1,300 square foot house with 36 people for dinner. And uh, good old Miss Sue just keeps on cooking away. We, you know, we had meatball subs and they were good. And, uh, and you didn't get any of them. And they were good. I got a question. Brom or Doug, how hard would it be to put the page number he's singing from up on the screen? Since the screen's already down anyway, when he comes out, would that be easy enough to do? Because, well, no, you wouldn't have to pre-plan. They just have to listen. You could just fire. You wouldn't have to be pre-planned, right? Because he doesn't know what he's doing, right? He just kind of think he could do it like spur of the moment stuff. Hey, Jason. Because I thought that would be handy because I never listened to him and neither do you guys. You know, so uh, we don't know what page he's on. I keep having to walk over here, and I thought, what if we just put the page up on the screen? That's exactly what I'm talking about, man. People just ain't paying attention. uh, Well, glory. I was telling folks, I go to the gym pretty frequently, but I hurt my elbows, so I can't do regular workouts. I did a leg workout. I am the biggest wuss this side of Joe Biden, man. I mean, that's bad. Yeah, that's bad. It, uh, I did that leg workout three days ago. I haven't been able to walk for three days. And I didn't have any weights. I was just going up and down with that hack squat. No weight, no weight. My legs are so sore. And the grandkids jumped on my lap today. <laughs> I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to act like I was a sissy. So I was like, oh, honey, I'm going to grab that leg. <laughs> so if you see me just standing here all the time, that's why it hurts to me. That's it, buddy. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Cheer up, believer. You'll be dead soon, man. That's moving up, buddy. That's moving up, right? We're moving on up to the east side, right, to that deluxe apartment in the sky. That's probably not politically correct now to talk about those type of things, is it? But uh, we're going to find out about political correctness. All right, Jack Robertson's here. We can start now. That's good. I saw Jack walk in. Jack, there's a girl over here looking for a guy. Look at that. You even come with your purse, man. Look at that. Dude, we're politically correct in here. <laughs> All right. We're going to have a word of prayer. What's, what's Dobie doing now? Is she doing an offertory or offertory? Okay. And then we got the Martin Overs. They're going to be, right? The Martin Overs singers will be singing for us. And we had the Spencer, Spencer Getters or something we used to have. And the Spencerton, the Spencerton getters, and uh, we would have that quartet sing. And now we got the Martin Overs who will be uh, singing for us. And uh, sounded really good, man. It went, uh, that was a blessing. But I honestly, Abby, I did not know that she was your older sister. And then she told me how old she was. I thought she looks great for 44. My <laughs> word, I mean, looks wonderful. <laughs> you bet, hon. Just leave it to me, to Encourage the saints, amen. All right. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I love you. I thank you for just the opportunity to be called a child of the king. The king. The king of all the kings and the lord of all the lords. And uh, we get to call you that. But on top of that, more intimately, we get to call you father. And I want to thank you for that, for adopting us into your family. You've given to us the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Lord, how intimate is that? Lord, I want to thank you for it. Lord, I want to be a help to the people. I want to prepare your people with the right spirit, the right approach to our culture, to be um, thoroughly convinced of the authority of your word so that we will not be silenced, but that we do it in the right spirit. So, Lord, help me to do that tonight. Lord, I thank you for the service. I thank you for uh, being able to see Deb again. Always a blessing to see our dear sister. May you encourage her. (coughs) And uh, uh, as she uh, uh, lives for thee, and and, uh, Lord, you bless uh, the kids. And... uh, watch over them in a very special way. Uh, Lord, I ask for your watch care over us tonight again. Just draw close. You are welcome here. You are welcome here. 
God visit us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. How about another song? Let's turn to page 84. Page 84. Page 84. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for first verse again, will we? Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me sing that with me again must jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free no there's a cross for a cross for me. You guys didn't get a bulletin, make sure to do that. I think I got one right to your rat's ear. <clears throat> you know what I forgot to do is call that evangelist this afternoon. I knew there was something I was forgetting to do. And, uh, but we will have that, that service. He said he had that week open. So that will be um, the first meeting, special meeting we've had since July of last year. So that will be good. And uh, looking forward to it. But, uh, we'll have our, do we have an OSF tonight? Okay. So we'll have OSF tonight here in just a second, our missions moment. And uh, that's with the Lindsays. Is that right, Douglas Allen? They were, who it is? Bamfies, okay, all righty. So uh, we will do that tonight and get that going. And um, again, Brother Hutchison, they had a tragedy happen early on. Their daughter uh, was nine years old at the time. There was a terrible accident, 
it was a church bus. I think it was a, it was a school bus, wasn't it, Deb? Yeah. And their nine-year-old was killed in that accident, and uh, just a, a tragedy. But it brought out in that couple, brother and sister Hutchinson, a sweetness that that's what they're known for, just compassion and tenderness. And I've wanted them for the longest time to be able to minister to you folks. And uh, we've tried to line up a couple's retreat here a while back, and calendars didn't match. And and uh, so I was thrilled that his schedule was open for that particular day. And so looking forward to that. Valentine Banquet, make sure to get signed up in the back table right there outside the uh, media booth. Let's get them signed up. We need to see how many we can fit in here in uh, the uh, got a team uh, of our ladies, four of our ladies are working together to, to plan it, to uh, get the decorations and the games, activities and things, and, uh, <clears throat> but we need to see how many we can fit in here, so make sure to get signed up so we know how many are going to be here, and uh, we'll go that route with it. I, I think they said it was like 10 or 12 tables that we can put in here round, but we will transform this into a banquet room and then we don't have to worry about any kind of issues um, with COVID and that type of thing. All right, still need giving statements. See Brother Doug, he'll get those for you. You can see those two handsome families there. Good to have it and good to have our new uh, members this morning and uh, the Prices and Sister Terry and uh, that is always great. All right, who we got? Titus has got a birthday this week, is that right? Titus, Ava's is today. Yep, yep, yep. All right. And uh, Abby Horbert is coming up this week. Ariel's is a week from today. And then Boo, Isaiah Fuentes, we call him Boo. And that's what everybody calls him. And uh, you can see that. All righty. Okay. And then in the missions moment, You'll see the address, the email address is there also. Feel free to write them and just say, listen, I give to the missions program through Lighthouse Baptist. I want you to know that uh, I, wanted, I was praying with you because your name was in the bulletin, and I was praying for you and your family. <coughs> the Lindsays are awesome. They're just awesome folks. They've been in Peru for years. They actually got kidnapped uh, when they were down there and uh, thrown in a trunk of a taxi or something. If I remember, that's been several years back. <clears throat> didn't didn't phase them a bit. They just stayed right at it. And uh, I remember when we took them off for support, we were in the parking lot of IHOP. You guys remember that? Made him stand up on a bike. He could yodel. He could yodel. And some of you don't even know what yodeling is probably. And, uh, so we made him stand up on the tailgate of my truck and yodel in the parking lot of IHOP. <laughs> He's good at it, man. He's so good at it. All right. Any other, anything else need to be said? All right, we're going to have missions moment. We're going to have OSF. We're going to have offertory. And uh, all right, come on forward, fellas. Appreciate that. We're going to have new guys coming up on that will be on greeters. If you are on the, you see your name on for usher, and uh, then the only requirement is shirt and tie. And uh, we just want that. We do have dress codes for, for different uh, services with the Lord, and that's one of them. And you see these handsome fellas. Here, and uh, I heard you getting a dog, man. Is that right, Jason? We're going to get you a dog. Yeah, there you go, man. Tis the season. Yeah, you get sick and you get dogs. Man. So when are you going to get him, you know? <clears throat> February 20? February 20. So he'll be chewing up everything in that brand new house you got, man. <laughs> All right. Did you talk to your brother today? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, he's all giddy, isn't he? Yeah, 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 they haven't set a date or anything, have they? Not that, nothing yet? All right, that'll be awesome. You tell them I'm available if they need me to do the wedding and fly me over to Japan. No, I ain't flying to Japan. We'd have to do a Zoom conference or something. Like that. I am working on, in fact, I haven't even talked to Luca. He's hearing about it as I tell you. I am working on a missions trip with Jeff. And uh, to Philippines, and I said, what if we took four or five, you know, half a dozen people? And uh, he said, great, man, you're finally going to go. I said, dude, I didn't say I was going. I said, I'm putting it together. And I thought, get Luke, some of our young people, 
maybe some adults want to go. I don't know. And, uh, but uh, I'm not interested in getting on that plane. That's like a 17-hour flight to Philippines. So, oops. This isn't made to fly that kind of hours. And, uh, but I am thinking about doing that because we need to get, I want to get our young people introduced to missions. And we need to, to, to do that. And God's been working in the Philippines for decades now, probably 30 years. That's been the hot spot in the world. And, uh, and so when you get over there, and, and uh, then you'll probably go to other areas. Uh, he went to Thailand, and, and uh, uh, I don't know if he went to Cambodia or not. We went several spots over there. And he knows it. His wife is from Korea, from Seoul. And, uh, and Jeff is comfortable anywhere in the world. You can put him anywhere, and he will make it. He's an amazing, missions-minded fellow. Was a missionary in Bulgaria for 23 years or something. <clears throat> so, uh, so we're looking at that. So be kind of keep that in your hip pocket, and then I'll need to talk with you more about it, and maybe talk to some teenagers that show that that desire to do that. I mean, we took Josh to Scotland, so we can take Josh to the Philippines, huh? <laughs> what about that? And you got kind of that Filipino kind of look to you. They, you fit right in, man. They never know the difference. <laughs> never know the difference. All right. Father, I love you. Bless the offering. Father, you know the needs. And, uh, Father, you've given us that command of tithing. The first 10% belongs to you. We know that. And, but then there's the giving. And you said that it will pour out a blessing that we wouldn't be able to receive it. And, Father, you certainly have done that. And, you know, we, I fear, Lord, and that's not, not really a fear. I, I, I feel Father, we are really blind to so many of the blessings that you've provided to us. And we really, I don't, I don't know that we'll appreciate it until they're gone. And uh, so, Lord, help us in that way. Open our eyes that we'd uh, behold wondrous things out of your law and we would recognize the blessings you give to us. Father, thank you again for this opportunity to prove the sincerity of our love. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
I could literally listen to that all day. That is awesome, Ruby. Uh, here's Cy is really coming along with the cello, so looking forward to Cy. Is it cello? Is that what that thing is, Cy? Grady? Oh, I thought it was Cy. I thought you was doing it. Oh, okay. All right, man. All right. So Grady's doing it, huh? You got that big old honking thing, like an overgrown guitar that you set on the ground and do that? Are you working on it? You stay at it, man. We'll have you up here, buddy. Looking forward to that. That's awesome, man. Great job, Dovey. Hallelujah. Oh, we got the Martin Overs ready to go. All right. Is this going to be like a acapella thing? Gee, look at you guys, man. Great job. Great job. All right. You tell me when you're ready. Where do we get the fancy schmancy microphone over there? Brad? Brad's stinking awesome, man. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that unsolicited song and testimony. All right. <coughs> Debbie, of course, you remember Drew. Yeah. Drew, he was my right-hand guy in building this building. Drew can do anything. He may not do it right, but it will work. It will work. I mean, he can do anything. We call him the Ridge Runner. And, uh, remember, that's a brother, uh, uh, Pavis, he used to call him the Ridge Runner. We go back in the back, and that, the sound on that side of the building wasn't working. Come back, and Brad says, I, I think I figured it out, Pastor. He says, take a look at this. Drew used some kind of an inversion thing, voltage inverter of some sort, from probably, it looked like, what do you think, Brad, 1817 or 1825? I mean, it was ancient, and the wires were just, just, Stuck together in some electrical tape on them, man. And he says, look at that, man. That's awesome. I said, that's Drew. Drew can make anything work, man. And that he did for a while, but now we're going to get it done in, in a little more permanent way. And, uh, Drew is one of our missionaries. We support him. He goes around and helps the churches build stuff all over the place, churches that can't afford different things. Little churches, Drew can go in there and make it happen. And uh, he is an enormous blessing, was to us and has been to churches across America. And uh, he is a dear brother. All right, this is the uh, first. We're breaking out the Martinovers. And uh, we'll have you guys have your own little banner and everything here real soon. <laughs> All right, go ahead, guys. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. And you were God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. And you are God alone. You're the only God whose power none can contend. You're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne and you are God alone. And right now in the good times and bad. Unshakable, unstoppable, 
That's what you are. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable. That's what you are. And you are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne and you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne and you are God alone. You are God alone. That was awesome, guys. Yeah, Ben, she can sing too. Is there no end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week will be wonderful. Ben and Abby will be singing for us next week. We're looking forward to that. Yeah, glory to God, man. Yeah, you stick to building. We'll let her do the singing. Amen. <laughs> All right. We're going to do OSF first. Is that what we want to do? All right. Ryan Christopher, we're going to do OSF first. And this has really helped out in getting extra money on principle. And on the principal to our payment, that's what we want to do. And as long as the general fund stays at $10,000 or above, then the general fund pays the mortgage, and then everything else goes to principal. We've got to knock this thing out. I don't know. He'll give us an update now. But uh, we got to. And then as soon as that, when that money comes in, it's, it goes right to the principal. We don't hold it all month and then put it there. We put it right there to knock that out with that compound interest thing going on. So, uh We'll do that. So whatever money you give tonight goes right to that principal and knock that thing out. Let's move on to the next phase. All right? All yours. All right. So just a quick update here. So we're going here. Goal is to make another payment. Forty two eighty five every month. We're trying to make that double. And uh, we've got 217402, which is actually really good for this month. So for those of you that have ever or that have been here for a while, we know that December, you have Christmas, and then you have a dip, and then we start trying to work out of that together. So to be able to do this this month is really uh, fantastic, and uh, I think it just speaks to the love you folks have for your church and the uh, group effort we're making to try to get this thing paid off. And it's not huge chunks. It's, it's just us striving day after day, service after service, to try to knock this out. So... Uh, we need about 21,1098 to make a double payment this month. So uh, we're going to take up another offering. We're going to do this every every single Sunday night until it's till that balance you see of 316 says zero. We're going to keep doing this uh, every Sunday. But here's what we want. Again, I'm I'm a huge huge uh, driver of culture at my own company. Um, I think I think the culture that you come here to church. Uh, and participate in is a huge part of why you continue to come. And so um, if you get to this moment in the service and any part of you goes into some negative zone somewhere, I want you just to tune me out for this moment, okay? Because I don't want you to get in your wallet and give because we don't want those type of givers to participate because it's not beneficial to you. It might benefit us as a group, but it's not beneficial to you. And we want you to grow here, not just to be... Uh, a participator, but to grow here in, as an individual and really become a, a giver from the heart, not just from necessity. All right. So we're going to take up an offering at this time. Uh, loose change, a buck here, a hundred there, whatever, it, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. But gentlemen, you can come forward right now. We'll do that. And then we'd like to count this up every Sunday night and let you know what, um, what step forward we made um, as a group together. So Heavenly Father, I thank you again. For this place, thank you for what it stands for. As dark as things um, are showing themselves to be, I'm thankful that I go to a place where there's solid footing, where it teaches me how to think critically, biblically, Lord, to um, operate with love in a world that's filled with hate. And Lord, I pray that tonight as we um, participate in this act of love, that God, you would uh, motivate us to go beyond our wallets, Lord, and to use our tongues and our mouth and the, um, Lord, the truths of your word to reach the lost this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
picking on you, Ron. He wasn't saying anything good either, man. <laughs> All right. I think it's time for our missions moment. They'll be counting up that offering back there also. I told him, I said, there it says 316, but we'll probably end up needing 328 because it'll be about $12,000 for my funeral when I drop dead. That, that, that thing finally gets paid off. Man, that's been a long time. I cannot even begin to tell you what that would be like. All right, you ready for the Bamfies? Man, this is a mission family. Dude, is this guy doing it? He is, he's got to be, he's probably close to my age. He's 42, 43. And uh, so, uh, no, he's, he's in his late 50s, mid late 50s. Uh, got his PhD, uh, economics, uh, Ivy League educated, went over to England, but I, and then God got hold of his heart. And man, what he is doing in Burma is amazing, and you're going to hear about it now. Okay. All right, so tonight's missions moment is the Banfis, our missionaries to Burma. And uh, here is a, a little picture of where Burma is at on the globe, and then here's specifically where they are at in Burma. All right, so a few updates. First of all, um, he sent a couple of videos of some graduates saying thank you. So we're going to play these a minute and uh, let's see how these come through here. All right, and then he's got this second one here too. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, so that's awesome. They teach them English and the Bible. All right, so that um, update about a Christmas program that they had. He said they were able to reach over 100 pagan Buddhist families with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, so that was a blessing. Uh, Bibles for Burma, an update on this. Um, he said, uh, as we told you, as, you t as we told you, we have already made our down payment on 10,000 Burmese Judson Bibles. That's the, Bi that's the Bible translated by Adniram Judson, which was, was that the 1800s? Or, and um, so that's what they're using. And uh, he said that'll be delivered this year, likely in August. And then um, he says, uh, he's talking about the need for that. He says, we, we were just contacted by a donor for another project to print Burmese Bibles in Japan and deliver them to Burma fully funded. Yeah. We have already agreed on the first printing of 2000 and plan many more printings, God yeah. willing. So that's a blessing. I just, I, yeah, it's hard to imagine not having the Bible like so many of these people do. But um, then uh, Brother Banfi's book on the deity of Christ. If you remember when he was with us, he talked about the deity of Christ and a book that he had written. Well, they translated that into Burmese, and um, and they've been distributing that. Here's a uh, here's a picture. It's not a very clear picture, but on that one all the way on the left is the book. And um, so they've been distributing those. He said that there's a very uh, well-known preacher in Burma who attacks the deity of Christ. And so they've, uh, they've really been trying to get these, these booklets distributed and get people really well-grounded on the deity of Christ. Such a, a crucial thing. And uh, so that's one thing. Uh, just two prayer requests that we're going to pray for tonight, that the deity of Christ would be defended, that those books would, would spread rapidly, and that, of course, those Bibles would spread rapidly um, as uh, those are distributed. All right? So let's pray for the band fees. Father, thank you for what you're doing through the band fees. Thank you that we get to have a part in that. And I ask that you would, um, I ask that you would protect them. And Father, I ask that your word would spread rapidly. I remember when the Apostle Paul asked uh, those believers, the Thessalonian believers, I think it was, that they, he asked them to pray for that, that your word would spread rapidly and that evil men would not be able to hinder the work. And I ask for that, Father and that people would be well-grounded in your word. And I ask that you would uh, just continue to use them and help, help these people who have heard the gospel. I ask that you'd continue to work in their hearts and help them to, to understand clearly their need and to be drawn by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the, uh, <coughs> I just got word that that offering brought us up to be able to make the second payment in full. 
And uh, hallelujah, man. That means that's over a $2,000 offering. Yeah, absolutely, man. Praise the Lord for that. Man, what did that do? man, I'm anxious to see what that does now for interest, how much interest that saves us and uh, how, much, how many months it knocks off. And every time we do that, knock that thing out, and uh, that would be just great, great, great. All right, great work, man. That was exciting to hear. Oh, and don't forget, we've got a uh, brother Keekover is putting together a, uh, uh, a maintenance day, not a cleaning day. It's not a spring cleanup. It is a maintenance day. We have some heavier maintenance that needs to be done. We've got to re-support the uh, baptistry. And uh, I got in there, and we were, uh, you know, holding our breath whether Carla and I were going to drop to the floor. But, but uh, no, they, they assured me it was fine. But they do need to get that done, so they're going to be doing that. We have some doors that need to be switched around. We have some doors that are going to be cut off and piano hinge, Dutch doors for nursery, so we don't have any more escaped convicts uh, running out into the auditorium. And, you know, you open up, and boom, they're gone. And uh, plus it also helps out that they don't get all wound up if they see a door open and there's mom or daddy and, you know, because once you get kids wound up, then it becomes a little bit of an issue. All righty. And uh, so, that, so if you know anything about construction and you want to lend your expertise, we're also going to have grunt people uh, that we don't know anything, but we can hand you tools. And uh, we can be an extra set of hands. And you do the brain work, and then we'll do the grunt work. And, uh, and then we, we'll, once we get that team set up, then we'll get some of our ladies together, and we'll have uh, provide lunch here at the church. Could it'll probably be a day's project, probably you think, Kendall, if we get enough good workers here. And we got countertops we're going to be doing. We got light uh, fixtures. The uh, light fixtures in the back, the white ones, the indirect sconces, those are probably 40 years old um, because I got them for out of the GE factory before they tore it down and put Menards there. And Menards' manager came over and handed me keys to it. I didn't know the guy. He says, hey, would you be interested? He says, you guys, you guys need anything for your building project and all? He says, here's keys to the GE factory. Go on over, take whatever you want out of there. And so we got we got a stainless steel sink out of there, really nice. We got uh, those sconces. We got an executive desk, and we got some stuff out of there. All right. So I say that because that's been 17 years ago, and they were probably 20 years old when we got them. And so uh, and they're kind of bent, you know. Teenagers have been swinging on them, that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we're looking at the pros prospects of, of replacing those with a nice indirect lighted sconce. I think there's six of them or eight of them on all down through there. So we may be doing that too. We don't know. We don't know we're going to do that. It just depends on cost because we're trying to pay the building off. But uh, we also want to make sure to keep it maintained and looking nice. Because who knows? We may have weddings going on around here. Right? Who knows? All right, take your Bibles. Amos chapter 7. We're going to finish up what we started this morning. Any other word need to be said before we get rolling? Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have the prices on board. Sister Terry on board with us. More workers. And uh, we'll see what God has in store. God's positioning people here for a reason. And uh, we're going to let him use us however he wants to use us. One of the things we're working on we've never done before is a Veterans Appreciation Banquet. And I really want it first class. Will be for all the veterans, whoever wants to come from the community, uh, veterans and their spouse, <coughs> just to say thank you, to let them know how much we appreciate the sacrifice of the men and women of our armed forces. And uh, we certainly want to do that. All righty, let's stand together if you're able. We're going to start in verse 14. Because that's what we're talking about answering now. Verse 14, and we'll go down through 17. I'll read the first, you the second, and we'll end up together. Then answered Amos. So now the man of God is answering the politically correct word police. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. 
but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me, let's do it together please, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of this land. Father, I ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Is it comfortable out there? We need a little warmth. You guys doing okay? I bet it feels just a little bit chilly, which is odd. Odd. And you guys all gave me a hard time about just now getting in on Duck Dynasty. Yeah. It takes me a while, man. It's only been like 10, 20 years since they've been doing that show. And, uh, and I just got in on it because I'm a Baptist. I just shared this with Doug the other day. You know how many Baptists it takes to change a light bulb? Change. <laughs> I thought it was cute. Yeah. All right. Well, we talked this morning. We, we learned about Amos. We learned uh, that he wasn't looking for the job, but God got hold of him. He wasn't college trained, higher educated. He was just a rancher and a farmer. He was a sheep herder and went went around picking fruit. That's all he was. He didn't have any credentials. He just had the touch of God. Wouldn't you rather have that than Dr. Dreyer than Dust? You'd rather have the touch of God. uh, So we talked about what's going to happen when he brought the message, and then they didn't like the message. And when he got to the point of, of, of really pinpointing the problems in the culture and where they were headed if they did not repent, the politically correct thought control word police didn't like it. And so we, we found, we looked at there in verses 10 and 11, that they would change the message, they would corrupt it, the message that you're trying to give. So when we go about to give the message of release from the tyranny of sin, they're not going to like that. Because see, when a person comes to know Christ, they're set free, and our allegiance is to God, not the state. And the state doesn't like that in a communist, socialist, tyrannical environment. They want you to be dependent upon the state. But as a Christian, God's our authority. Amen. Amen. Right there. So they will corrupt your message, pervert it, try to, to, to try to silence you that way. The message, and if they can't silence the message, then they try to silence the messenger. Verse 12 and 13, they say, get out of here, go away, you're not welcome here anymore, we're not listening to what you have to say. And so they silence then the messenger, and we talked about how that was uh, prevalent, something certainly not new. You remember when uh, Joseph uh, came to his brothers, and they say, him, here comes that dreamer, and they didn't like his, his prophecy that the 12 stars would make obeisance to him and the sun and moon would bow down to him. And, uh, and they didn't like that. And so they said, we're going to shut him up, and they threw him in a pit. And then he got sold into slavery. Of course, we knew that Jeremiah got cast into a pit and, uh, and would have died were it not for one coming to his aid. Uh, they couldn't silence the message, so they silenced the messenger. Elijah, his confrontation with Jezebel. She couldn't argue the message, so she attacked the messenger. Paul was arrested in the temple. Silas was cast into prison, all because they would not be silent. And I and sat here with, again with, with Debbie in the congregation tonight. Uh, I, somehow I see that the state's thought of silencing would not work well with David. I don't, I, I don't see David would be too intimidated that as a teenager, am I right, in the 70s, he was smuggling Bibles into Russia. And when, we, when we looked at the, um, the printing on Washington, uh, in the 70s, that's what 
her husband was doing. And, uh, and he would tell stories. Uh, I, I think it was him telling me the story about they had a van filled with Bibles at the border. And when they got there, they thought, oh, man, we're going to prison. And the soldiers got into the, to the van set, filled with Bibles, filled with Bibles. And they took a, a, a handkerchief or a Kleenex box out and started throwing Kleenexes everywhere. Because word got out that they were, people were smuggling drugs in Kleenex boxes. That's how God blinded the eyes of the border guards in a communist country. And all those Bibles went into the country, came out. And they were, they were, they were worried about Kleenex boxes. Yeah, God's able. God's able, man. Well, today we're facing a, an assault on our liberties and our freedoms. Freedom of speech is central to, to the freedoms and liberties of anyone. And especially, especially the United States of America. And then remember I brought up in the 1798 uh, uh, signing of the Alien Sedition Act and President John Adams wanted to silence all opposing voice and how 28 Republican, these weren't, again, modern-day Republicans, these were before Abraham Lincoln, and 28 Republican editors of newspapers were prosecuted because they printed stuff that was not favorable toward John Adams. And that's exactly what's going on right now. That's exactly and uh, that's what happens with Facebook, what happens with Twitter, um, you know, and, and we're talking about more of that as we go on. So, when they can't win the battle of ideas, they must silence the messenger. So, what is to be our response to those attacks? In chapter 7, verse 14, we just read it, through 17, it was then answered Amos. Uh, the first four words of 14 were critical because the man of God, the children of God, would not be silenced even amid the threat and the assault of culture. And you had Jeroboam, which was wicked as a devil. You had Ahaziah, or Amaziah, who was the high priest of a calf-worshipping culture. And they told the believer in Jehovah God, they said, you need to shut your mouth and then you need to get out of here. But what did he do? The first four words, then answered Amos do. Uh, the first three words, then answered Amos. Then answered Amos. He was not going to be silenced and neither can you. Neither can you. You must never allow your testimony to be silenced. He, he, uh, he wasn't standing on his pride or his intellect or his long-standing reputation. Again, look how he begins his rebuttal in verse 14. I was no prophet, neither I was a prophet's son. I was a herdman, a gatherer of sycamore fruit, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock. He wasn't bragging on anything. He had nothing in and of himself to boast on. His boast was in God. That's all it was. And so, therefore, we cannot allow ourselves to be silenced. I was talking to one of the brothers uh, this morning after service, and he was uh, sharing with me some of the challenges that he's having at work and about is your, your position uh, uh, politically going to cost us clients? But he says, preacher, preacher, I was thinking my position isn't political. It's biblical. And it may transfer to politics, but it's a biblical position. And see, when we take a stand, even in, in this situation, when we take a stand, God will provide and care for us. He will do that. I shared with him the story I've shared with you. When, when my commander was using the Lord's name in vain, and I asked her, and all, as, with as much respect as I could, I said, Major, could you take that language into battle staff? She could have thrown me in jail for insubordination. But I had about as much of that as I was going to listen to. She was talking about my father, right? And you wouldn't let somebody talk about your family like that. And I wasn't going to let that. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant Spencer, I'm sorry. And went in there. Oh, man, God stepped in because I just stepped into some deep water legally. But God stepped in. And then, uh, you know, I, I come to stateside in 1990. I'm sitting in the, in the second uh, seat behind the driver in a, in a Suburban. And my first shirt, my first sergeant, we call him shirt, my first shirt, my first sergeant, and my commander were in the front seat. 
And they got to talking about the dorm super, supervisor who was one of our brothers, one of my brothers in church. He was getting ready to retire. And they were not talking favorably about him. And they were running him down and saying unkind things about him. And, uh, and so I said, excuse me, sir. I said, Sergeant so-and-so is one of my brothers at church, and he's a dear friend of mine. Could we go a different direction with this conversation? Oh, okay. And they did. Right? But see, if, if you take a stand, if you won't be silenced, God will provide. So don't be, don't be silenced. Don't be intimidated into silence. Again, in essence, what he was saying, Amos was saying, is I, I didn't want this job to begin with, but I got it, and God gave it to me. And again, remember, 60, was it 68 times, was it, that he said, thus saith the Lord. Throughout those nine chapters, 141 verses, almost every two verses, he was repeating that statement that, hey, it's not my message. It's God's message. Thus saith the Lord. And that's where we got to come back to. The authority's here. If you want to argue, argue with God. Try to convince God. You know? But it's not about our message. It's about God's message. God caught a hold of my heart, and I cannot but speak the things that God has shown me. So when confronted with a message, you have to share, be careful to remember whose message it is that you are giving out. It's not about you. It's all about the Lord. Pride is what the world's looking for to find in you and as it will justify their position. Peter and the apostles, after being arrested and beaten on more than one occasion, gives us this advice in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. That was after they were beaten. After they were arrested multiple times, they said, listen, we're not changing. And as long as you will, again, not being obstinate, we'll talk about all this, not trying to be unkind to people, but just taking a stand. And, and if you perform at work, they will listen to you. But you can't go in as a Christian at work and be a lazy bum. You can't go in always complaining and whining about this, that, and then expect them to listen to you when you have something to say. You have, as a believer, you must be the best employee they've got. I mean, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to what? The glory of God. The affirmation of what God has revealed about himself. God says, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. So you show that in your workplace. You aren't trying to, to lie your way out of things or trying to find some place in the back warehouse to goof off. No, you're there to work. And if your job is done, what you're assigned to, then grab a broom. But do something. I remember when we owned Blimpy, and that was our greatest bane that we had in owning the company, is you couldn't find people that wanted to work. They were all just lazy. And when you found somebody that wanted to work, you tried to hold on to them with everything you got. We got some families in our auditorium tonight that, that loaned us their children to work. And, uh, man, we wanted to keep them. We wanted to do anything we can to keep them because those kids could work. Teach your kids to work. It's all right. You're not abusing your kids to take away their video games. Tell them to get their little butt out there and work a little bit. That'll be okay. Working's okay. All right, maybe it's not. Maybe y'all do what you want to do, man. And uh, anyway, notice what happens next. After they said we ought to obey God rather than man. After having publicly stood for the cause of Christ and putting their lives on the line for his word's sake, they were facing death. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. I want you to see this. Acts chapter 5, verse 29 first. We're talking about facing a culture, the cancel culture, the politically correct, the word police, the thought police, the reprogramming that they're talking about. Have mercy. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the others answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. All right, they were, gonna, they were facing prison. They were facing obvious persecution. But look in verse 33 what happens. After they take that stand publicly, 
In verse 33, when they heard that, they were cut to their heart, the council, and took counsel to what? So now they're facing death. They're going to kill these guys, Peter and the other apostles. But look what happens in verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Bring them out here. Hold on a second. Now, you've, you've heard Gamaliel's name before because he had his top student. Anybody know who it was? Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, who could become the Apostle Paul. So here is Saul of Tarsus probably hearing his professor, Gamaliel, speak. And what kind of impact that had on Paul also, or Saul of Tarsus? But in verse 38, Gamaliel says, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak the name, in the name of Jesus and let them go. You know what they did right after they left? Went right out and preached. Same people, same place, Solomon's porch, same message. It didn't matter what they did to him. Why? Because there was, such, there was a burden, there was a drive, there was a commission that came from God. And you can't silence that. That, that. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. We have to stay at it. We cannot back up. We cannot turn aside. We cannot give in. God was with them. God had his eye upon them. God had told them that he would be with them until the end of the world. In Acts, or Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples, his apostles, before he ascended up from the Mount of Olives, the, one of the last things he said was this. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Then he makes this promise to them. I am with you always even unto the end of the world. Amen. Mark the evangelist records it in a little different way when he says this in 1620, and they, the apostles, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Now listen, that was, that was said to the church. The apostles are the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. And so we know that he, that's a commission he's given to his people. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will always be with us. So have that confidence that you have God on your side. And if it's you and God, it's a majority, right? All right? Freedom to speak openly without seeking injury or harm to another is the very foundation of our liberty. George Orwell, of whom we're hearing a lot in these days, Stated in his book, Animal Farm, with regards to liberty and free speech, I quote, If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they don't want to hear. That's a pretty good statement. I don't know, I know nothing about George Orwell or his theology. Uh, I don't know where his philosophical position is, but that is an accurate statement. If liberty means anything at all, if freedom means anything at all, it means the right to tell people something they don't want to hear. But that's what you're told you can't say. It's easy to be bold when speaking from a pulpit in a church of mostly like-minded people. Courage is needed when you are confronted with those of a differing opinion or conviction. So the ungodly work to form a public perception, that's what they do. Social media determines what is right and wrong in our present culture. Somewhere is your authority. Somewhere. Something will be your authority. It may be Facebook. It may be Twitter. It, uh, I don't know, some other, what's another real popular social media thing? Instagram, it may be one of the, it may be those, it may be your personal experience, it may be your religious upbringing, it may be a dogma of a denomination that you hold, or it may be the word of God. Now I would proffer that 
The Word of God needs to be your authority. It is the final authority. When you spend time in social media, you will find yourself being intimidated to silence by the conversational shaming that is promoted there. Verbal attacks against your message or efforts to social, uh, uh, social analysis experts have titled passive aggressive will be employed to shame you into silence. Boy, don't we know that happens. The success of social intimidation is felt in your daily life. Let me illustrate it. When I grew up, we played Cowboys and Indians. We played Cowboys and Indians. Now just to say the word Indian is offensive. And God have mercy that you was a cowboy. Because cowboys carried guns with bullets in them. And then cowboys, generally speaking, cowboys committed that greatest of cultural sins in modern day America, and they were white men. So now you got white privilege. And then if you allow your kids, even today, to play cowboys and Indians, and you teach your kid to have a gun and go, how horrible are you? I can remember about a year ago when one of the little kids was out here and I went, and I felt guilt as soon as I did that. Because culture tells you that that's a terrible thing. Guns are terrible things. Guns are good things. Promote more guns, more guns. That's what we need. You need more guns, you're going to have more gun violence. No, you're not. Good people with guns stop bad people with guns. It's pretty simple. I mean, I've had guns my whole life. They've not killed one person. So guns don't kill people. And it's good to have them. And if you don't have them, get them. You don't have to like them, but learn how to use them. All right? Because that, that is a deterrent. That is a deterrent. Right? Like, you know, those little signs, I thought they are cute. This house protected by Smith & Wesson. You know, uh, you know, we believe in God and guns. You come into our house uninvited. You'll meet them both, you know, those kind of things. And, uh, but we need to know that. It's, it's the right thing to do. Jesus even said, you got two cloaks, sell one, go buy a sword. It's okay. It's okay. And if, you do, if you're not comfortable, take training so at least you know which end to point. You know, that would be good. All right? But they succeed in teaching us or, or silencing us. Today, if you allow your children to play the child's game, you are guilty and condemned by the politically correct mob for teaching your children two things. Number one, guns are an acceptable form of protection. We don't need guns. We need social workers. Dear Lord, did anybody else think that had to be the most asinine statement you have ever heard? We don't need, we need to defund police and send out social workers. Anybody want to be a social worker? Yeah, this guy's shooting people, Mike. And you go, oh, go out there and talk to him. Maybe you can talk him down. I ain't going out there. Yeah, you go out there. You think that's a great idea? It's like those Muslims teaching, all right, you kids need to go out and blow yourselves up. I'm like, you do it first. Show us how that works. Oh, well, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> Oh. oh, man, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, they didn't have a bunch of social workers around the White House. They had troops. Yeah. That was interesting how they wanted to tear down the wall, but they put one around the White House, state and capitol building. Whatever. I wonder if this is going to get on Facebook. You think I'm going to get on Facebook with this? Then perhaps, even worse, in the frigid eyes of a snowflake, you are corrupting your children by allowing them to practice cultural appropriation. How do you do that? Well, how dare you allow your child to put pigeon feathers in a rubber band and place it around their head and act like an Indian? I, I didn't mean an Indian, a Native American, because you can't say Indian. I've often said I don't have any problem eating a Cracker Barrel, and I'm a white guy. That'll register here in a little bit. What do they call us? Call us crackers. 
call white people crackers because we're dry and flaky. I'm all right. I'm good. I'm good. That doesn't offend me in the least. Couldn't care less. In fact, I think it's kind of funny. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And if you saw white people dance, you would understand why they say that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Is your baseball team named the Indians? That's offensive to white people who condescend to Indian people and feel the Indians are too weak and unintelligent and lack the wherewithal to stand up for themselves. So white people say you got to change your name. <laughs> Thank you. Is your football team called the Redskins? Well, the last thing an Indian would want is to have their race represented as champions. You guys are helping me with this message. Yeah. You said, what about the potatoes? Yeah. <laughs> you guys, man. I'm trying to teach something here. I'm trying to train. Is your state college known as the Fighting Illini? If so, then you must get rid of your mascot, Chief Illiniwick, because he does a native dance at halftime espousing the power and dominance of the Indian race. And the last thing we want to espouse or promote is that Indians have a vivid and a powerful historic culture. We can't, we can't have that happen. We've got to get rid of that. You'll be shamed into silence by the unrelenting pressure of your culture. When you preach the gospel of Christ, you are telling others that Jesus is the only way to be forgiven and find an eternal home in heaven. Therefore, since you are unrelenting, you are a bigot because you believe only one way to salvation. Do you believe that God allows only men to be pastors? Only men, based on 1 Timothy 3. So when you say that you believe only men, women cannot be a pastor, then you're a sexist. Word police, thought police, intimidation. Shaming you into silence. He's shaming me. Because I've got the authority here. I didn't say it. It's like that time that lady cornered me at a meeting and I'd written this track. And she said, she comes up to me, bouncing up to me at this meeting. And she says, Did you write this track? Yeah. Well, you're teaching heresy. Like, what? She says, you said right there that you have to repent in order to be saved. I said, I didn't say that. You did too. Look right here. I said, I did not say that. You did say I said, no, I didn't. Jesus said that. Well, well. They try to sign. As long as you have the authority. And you're not trying to be unkind to anybody. You know, we don't, we don't want to be obstinate and unkind. But when you be dogmatic... It's going to come across to some people as offensive. That's why they need safe spaces. And honest engine, not kidding you. That's why I shouldn't have used that term. Coloring books for people to color so they can learn how to handle their vulnerability and victimhood. <laughs> safe spaces. Do you believe in biblical marriage? I didn't say traditional marriage because I don't care what tradition says. What does the Bible say? Do you believe in biblical marriage? One man, one woman. You believe in that? Well, if you do, then you're a homophobe. I had to look that up. I knew what a homo was, but I wasn't sure whether it was homo sapien or homosexual. Or I'm not, I'm not afraid of man. I'm not a homophobe, but they're talking about your, you, you hate homosexuals, sodomites. I don't hate them. They need the gospel. Get the gospel to them. I'm just going to preach against it. Absolutely, I'm going to preach against it. Absolutely. Why? Because the Bible preaches against it. And you wouldn't believe how they pervert the message. Used it this morning at the end of 1 Corinthians. Greet one another with a holy kiss. They said, see, and when I'm telling you, God, I, I'm just repeating 
and I'm serious, I'm, this is not, I, Lord, it's not sacrilegious. But when they said Jesus kissed Judas Iscariot, I saw the video that Hollywood put out. It was disgusting and filthy and perverted. But they said, see, Jesus was a homosexual. But we're supposed to be silent. Do you believe that there are certain religions in other countries that want to destroy the United States? Well, then you're a xenophobe. So, so far, according to the Ten Commandments of the liberals, that you are a sexist, a homophobe, and a xenophobe. There's some other cool words, but I don't know them. All these politically correct word censures, if you are not continually in your Bible and in communication with God, will shame you into silence. Freedom is the right to exchange ideas to the point of offending someone else. That is freedom. That is freedom. You'll notice that Amaziah was fine with telling Amos to shut his mouth and move on, but they won't offer the same privilege to you. Isn't that interesting? You can't talk like that, but you're not allowed to say, you can't tell me that. Right? That's true. Stop, think critically, spin it around. You're telling me you can't talk. I can remember when, when all this was really gaining steam. I was still in the military, had my Bible on my desk, and somebody complained about it. And I was asked, my, my captain says, uh, Sergeant Spencer, would it be all right? Maybe we could put the, the Bible in your desk drawer. I said, no, it's not. It's not. We have freedom. And you don't lose it when you go in the military. Okay. Why didn't Amos tell Amaziah to shut his mouth and go away? Because Amos wanted to enter into dialogue so he could present God's word to a needy soul. We're not asking them to shut their mouth and go away. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's get into the arena of ideas. Let me give you the word of God and you try to defunct it. You try to say that doesn't work and that's a lie. That's why you have the right to believe whatever you want to believe as long as it does not infringe upon my liberties. No one has a right to our freedoms that would take our freedoms to take away our freedoms. So they don't have the authority to do that. Once they exercise those liberties and freedoms that comes uh, with being, it's innate with being an American, if they try to take away your freedoms, that's where it stops. Like somebody says, your freedom of expression stops at my nose. Right? When you go punch me in the nose, it's on like Donkey Kong. You, got, you can argue all you want, but you don't sign. Why do you want to shout down and silence somebody? Just talk it out. Let's just sit down and have a battle of ideas. You convince me why it's right, why it's right to take away money from people who earned it to give it to people who won't. You convince me of that. Right? I'm, I'm game. I'm not talking about helping people who need it. I'm talking about not helping people who are lazy. All right? And so you convince me of that. You convince me there's more than two genders. Sit down and let's talk about it. You convince me of that. I'm going to listen. I'm not mad at anybody. I will listen. But let's get into an exchange of ideas. Let's talk about it. You know, when Bill, what's his name, told me that homosexuals can love just like heterosexuals can. I said, Bill, it's impossible. It can't happen. He says, you ask your church. I said, I know my church, Bill, and that's not going to happen. I said, and here's why. I said, Bill, you take 50 homosexual couples, put them on an island, come back in two years, and you're going to have 50 homosexual couples or less. You put 50 heterosexual couples on an island and come back in two years, you're going to have huge families. You're going to have four or more. Why? Because they don't love the same way. God didn't make it that way. You don't see two bulls out in a pasture. Nature itself teaches you. All right, maybe I'm getting a little bit. Maybe we ought to move on from that one. Okay. Canadian Mark Harding was sentenced to 340 hours of sensitivity training by an imam for speaking out against Islam. 
in Canada. Speaking out against Islam. And so he has to undergo sensitivity training, thought control, because you said something about bad about Islam. Sit down and talk about it. Is there any way to have your sins forgiven in Islam? No. Mm -mm. So what's the problem? You choose not to believe in Christianity? That's your prerogative. That's no problem. Just understand you must accept the consequence to your decision. But if you choose not to believe that, man, I don't have any skin in the game. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm moving on to the next one. But they can't have that. They have to shut you down. If you don't like guns, you don't buy one. But if you're a liberal, you outlaw them for everybody. Why? That doesn't make any sense. You, just, you, don't, you got this show and you don't like that show, don't watch it. Oh, no, but they're going to, I couldn't figure out how Doug Dynasty made it. They mentioned Jesus Christ openly. And they shot things. Pigs. Right on TV. I watched him shoot him and drop him and gutted him right on TV. That was awesome. That, that was awesome. You know, I, I, I love this show. I'm, I'm a fan now. I'm, well, Johnny come lately, but I thought, anybody's going to mention Jesus Christ and kill things and eat it, that's great. Man. Hallelujah. But if you don't like it, then don't watch it. All right? Simple enough. When you respond to the word, police, you must do so with love. Up in here, I'm in a, I'm in a group of like-minded people. And so there'll be a touch of sarcasm comes out because we all understand how foolish this sounds to us. And so I come across that way. I don't mean to come across, and I never would come across that way if I'm in a conversation with somebody because they genuinely believe what they're espousing. So convince me, convince me that Black Lives Matter is right. Convince me of that. When your stated purpose is to destroy the nuclear family, and that, that's a European white thing, and that you don't need a man and a woman and, and children. You don't need the new. We're here to destroy the nuclear family. You got facts for that? Argue your point. Let's talk. Argue your point. If black lives matter, then what about pre born black lives? Is that okay? Is that, so then we, we shouldn't have abortion for black people, right? That's that. I'm just I'm just asking questions. These are these are this is food for thought, and just statements that we need to consider. Critically think, apply apply the philosophy to their argument, and give them space to talk. It's okay, it's okay. But that's going to mean you're going to have to study to know what you believe. You can't just go out there and espouse what a preacher said. That ain't going to fly. Well, you need to find out what you believe and why you believe it. And in kind and loving, but convictingly and unabashedly setting in that this is it's not a negotiable position. You're telling me you think that anybody who doesn't trust in Jesus goes to hell. Yes, I do. I do. That's non-negotiable. Well, what about Jewish people? What about them? They need Christ. Well, what about Muslims? Same. What about Mormons? Exactly the same. What about Catholics? Doesn't matter. What about Baptists? Same thing. There's only one way, right? And th that's non-negotiable. And so, but you don't go out mad about it. You just state a fact. This is the way it is. God said it. He didn't ask our opinion. Our job is to promote what God said. Again, when you respond... Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love. God, uh, Paul wrote to the Colossian church, says, let your speech be always with grace. Remember, grace is the revelation of God's will. So when you respond to the cultural the censure, you are relaying God's will, not your prejudices. To resort to name calling is to fail of the grace of God. That's not going to get anywhere. I have been victim of doing that, of name-calling, of ridiculing, of demeaning people because they held a different position. That's not the right thing to do. Find out what you believe, why you believe it, and simply state your position. But don't back up. Do not back up. And never tolerate a lie. 
Let's say, well, that may be. If they said something that's just not true, then don't tolerate that. Don't tolerate that. Well, it's a, you, you can see here that Jesus was never married, and therefore he was a homosexual. It's a lie. You, don't talk, you can't go any further with that. You can't go any further because that's a lie. And we have, and you have the scriptures behind it. And uh, man doesn't, you know, as a man lays with a man, he does with a woman, he ought to be killed. That's Old Testament. We're into grace now. I'm not saying kill anybody. But I'm saying that does show God's attitude toward homosexual relationships. Again, to resort to name calling is to fail of the grace of God. Lutzer, in his book, We Will Not Be Silenced, shares the following account in the life of Hugh Latimer, a 16th century Protestant. He was brought before King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII was known for what? Anybody know? Uh, yeah, he was that too. He was known for a bunch of wives. And what would he do to them if he didn't like them? He'd whack them. Yeah. You remember that? Henry VIII, I am, I am. You know, that old, old song from years, 100 years ago. All right. Latimer, Latimer, do you remember you are speaking? This is what it was in his heart. This is what's going on in his heart. Right? He's before Henry VIII, who was infamous for his murderous tirades against all opinions that clashed with his. Latimer has been called to speak before Henry VIII. In his heart and mind, this confrontation occurs. Latimer, Latimer. Do you remember you are speaking before the high and mighty King Henry VIII who has the power to command you to be sent to prison and how he can have your head cut off if it please him? Will you not take care to say nothing that will offend royal ears? In his mind, Latimer paused for a moment then continued. Latimer, Latimer, do you not remember that you are speaking before the king of kings, the lord of lords, before him at whose throne Henry VIII will stand, before him to whom you one day will also have to give an account? Latimer, Latimer, be faithful to your master and declare all of God's word. That's the courage that we need. Latimer, Latimer would be allowed to live by Henry VIII, but he would be burned at the stake not long after. Not by Henry VIII, but by his satanically possessed sister Mary, Queen of Scots, also known as Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Again, in closing, let this verse that I have adopted as a daily challenge to my Christ life serve as a challenge to you in the present social climate. And this is my life verse. Only fear the Lord. No others. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. Why? For consider how great things He hath done for you. Let that be a challenge to your heart. Let's stand together. Father, as I've sought today to encourage the believers in this present climate, our message will be corrupted, perverted, and used against us. If we will not stop, they will try to silence us. But Father, our response is to be with love, with compassion, but with great and unflinching conviction. We ought to obey God rather than man. Father, I know these type of messages are sobering. The reality of it is in our face right now. Father, we need courage. Father, I pray for the saints of this church that they would fall to their knees and beg you tonight for courage to stand appropriately, kindly, lovingly, but unflinchingly. But we would beg you for courage. Help me, Father, to preach a message like this opens me up to public scorn and ridicule and assault. Lord, I'm not looking for that. But Lord, we need a generation. We need a church right here trained and prepared 
to stand against the wiles of the devil. And Lord, I pray that right now in the hearts of our people, there would begin to be a crying out for courage. Lord, help me to stand and teach me how to stand. Lord, help me to know exactly what I believe and why I believe it. Lord, these are the frontline troops here on a Sunday night. God, I ask that you would help us. As our pianist begins to play, if you'd like to deal with the Lord, I invite you to come. Teach your young people to have courage. Pray with them, Dad. Kneel with your young people. Tenderly and compassionately. Beg God in their hearing for courage. We enjoy the pleasures of the Lord. We enjoy the benefits and blessings of being Americans. But there is a responsibility that comes to grace that comes with grace I should say God has administered his grace to you and your family and daddies we have a responsibility to train up our family in that truth we owe God everything we can't be silenced We can't back up. We can't turn aside. Amen. you have children in the nursery, why don't you go ahead and go pick those children up. We'll close in prayer here in a second. If you have children in the nursery, go ahead and go get them. We will close in prayer in a moment. Yeah, just the parents need to go. 
Father, I love you. I thank you for a chance to be here tonight. I thank you for this church. For these people, they have no, again, I, I just don't know that they'd understand. I, I guess if you haven't been a pastor, it would be tough to understand just the blessing that they are to my heart. The encouragement, words fitly spoken in due season are like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And Lord, as we go out from here, we begin our battle with the devil right away. Many will be off to work tomorrow morning, some tonight perhaps. That we would go out refreshed, revived, and encouraged. That we would speak the truth in love, having our conversation, our speech with grace, seasoned father in a way that we can give an answer of the hope that lieth within us with meekness and fear that our fear would be of thee not of our culture not of the social climate so lord help these dear dear saints i want to do my best to train them prepare them and god i pray that you put within their heart a mindset of resolve that we will do the Lord's work regardless. We will speak the truth. Father, bless these dear saints. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.